Hi, everybody. This is uh, Silvio Canto in Dallas, Texas, on Tuesday, April 25th. If you can believe it, end of April, one-third of 2017 has gone by. That's pretty hard to believe, but that is the way it is. Doesn't it seem like just yesterday that we were celebrating Christmas or Valentine's Day or whatever? But here we are, April 25th, and we're ready to go. We have some great topics to get into today. I've got a couple of topics. Uh, I have a post over at the American Thinker about the election in France. I want to talk about the way that these two candidates are being presented to the world. It's very interesting. And I think you can see a little bit of media bias in the way that's, uh, that's going on. I also have another post in process about the Democrat Party and abortion. Perhaps you had a chance to uh, hear what the chairman of the Democrat Party said about pro-life or pro-choice or abortion issues. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing what he said. And we'll talk uh, about that as well. We're also going to take a look at some of the other issues of the day that are out there, like Ann Coulter, North Korea. Uh, the wall that apparently is now going to be, or the border wall, that is, that apparently is now going to be delayed uh, for another year. At least that's what we're hearing today. But I want to begin by going back on this day in 1976 and reminding all of you about one of the most patriotic things that happened in the United States uh, really over the last 50 years. And it happened on a baseball field of all places. It was April 25th, 1976. It was an afternoon game. In Wrigley Field, the Dodgers uh, were in town to play the Cubs. You know, they used to play afternoon baseball in Wrigley Field uh, back then. And, you know, it's just another routine April game, nothing nothing more or less. And uh, Rick Mundy was the center fielder for the Cubs. He was a pretty good player, and he was playing center field. And as the inning is getting started, this is, I guess, the fourth inning. As the fourth inning is getting started, Rick Mundy notices two guys had jumped on the field. They had an American flag. And they were trying to burn the American flag. They had apparently some fluid, some gasoline, and they were trying to light the match. And uh, Rick Mundy ran. He grabbed the flag. And, of course, at the same time, security people had already jumped on the field, and they arrested uh, the two young men. But Rick Mundy, Rick Mundy literally saved the American flag that day. And it became, in many ways, his signature moment as a baseball player, even though, of course, he had many other successes on the field. But I think it was a great patriotic moment and something that we need to be reminded of every single year. It's now 41 years uh, since it happened. But uh, I never get tired of talking about this. And, of course, 1976, uh, for those of you who remember 1976, that was the bicentennial year. A lot of people were caught up in the bicentennial, you know, July 4th, 1776. The country, I'm not saying that it was an era of good feeling. They were obviously some partisan issues in the country, as there always is. But, you know, we had put Watergate behind us. We had put Vietnam behind us. And I think there was a certain sense of patriotism that spring, that summer, because of the bicentennial. And to have Rick Monday do this in 1976 or the year of the bicentennial, I just thought it was fantastic. And I love talking about it. If you want to see the picture, I have a picture on my blog, on Twitter, Uh, my Twitter account. I also have one on Facebook. You don't even have to be my friend to see it because I have it on a public view. But it's just a great moment, a great moment on this day, April 25th, 1976, when Rick Monday saved the American flag from being burned. I I just love, love telling the story. Well, let's talk a little bit about the election in France. I have a post over at the American Thinker this morning where I talk about the way that this election is being presented to the world. Very interesting. Uh, you have two candidates now. They they went through a runoff, or they went through the first round. Now they're going to to the second round. The two candidates are Mr. Macron and Miss Marine Le Pen. Uh, Mr. Macron used to be a, a part of the Socialist Party. He left the Socialist Party. He kind of ran as an independent. And Miss Le Pen, I'm not exactly sure what party she belongs to, but she's always been associated more with the right. Uh, She has uh, some very strong views on immigration and national identity and all of that. And it's interesting how the international media is presenting these two people. Uh, Mr. Macron, who is 39 years old, is being presented as some type of a a John Kennedy, like a French John Kennedy uh, picture. And then Miss Le Pen is being presented as this intolerant right-wing anti-immigration The truth of the matter is neither picture is correct. 
Mr. Macron is not a centrist. He's a leftist. And Ms. Uh, Le Pen is not a right-wing crazy person. She's got a lot of very serious issues, and she talks about a lot of serious things affecting the country. But I think it's very disappointing how the media is characterizing this. And I hope that if you have a chance to, uh, to pay attention to the election, if you have a chance to see uh, what is going on in this election, I hope you look beyond. I hope you look beyond the projection that the international media is giving you of these two people. France has very serious problems. Uh, they're not having babies, so they've got a real demographic problem. They have a crushing welfare state. And on top of that, they have an immigration policy that is creating chaos in the country. So they have some real problems. And I don't see Mr. Macron, frankly, or the, the political class in France dealing with any of this. Now, on the other hand, Ms. Le Pen is at least talking about two of those, immigration and the welfare state. So hopefully... Before the election, the election is in two weeks, so it's like 10 days away. Hopefully, by then, I think the world gets a more balanced presentation of these two people. Because right now, right now, it's uh, a picture that clearly favors uh, Mr. Macron. And I don't think that's fair, because he's not the centrist that he's been made out to be. And she's not the crazy right winger that she's been made out to be. So hopefully... Uh, that can be cleaned up so that we can learn who these two people are and what exactly, what plans they have for their country. We're going to listen from our friend, we're going to hear this from our friend Carlos uh, Guedes, and we'll be right back. This is Carlos Guedes, Harpies, and I would like to see you guys this Saturday night at Nola Brasserie Authentic Cajun and Creole Restaurant, located at 1201 Main Street, downtown Dallas. I'll be performing instrumental high-energy jazz at 7.30 until midnight. So make your reservation today at 469-872-1820. If you get a chance, uh, go down and see my friend Carlos uh, over at Nola's in downtown Dallas. I think you're going to enjoy it a great deal. Great music and great uh, food, and I think you're just going to love it. It's going to be a great Saturday night. Take your wife or girlfriend or your family, whatever it may be, or just go out with some friends, whatever it may be. It's, uh, it's a great place to enjoy your, your Saturday night. Well, I mentioned that I have a, another post, hopefully will be out tomorrow, uh, where I talk about the Democrats and abortion. The, the chairman of the, the Democrat Party, the new chairman, he's only been on the job, I guess, about two months, Tom Perez, used to be in the Obama cabinet, gave a speech the other day where he basically said that the Democrats, Democrat candidates have to be, have to recognize that uh, a woman's right to choose, which is, of course, their funny way of saying that uh, you have to accept abortion. And I, I thought that was an insane remark for a head of a political party to say that, because look, half of the country is pro-life. You can say the other half is pro-choice, but the other half is pro-life. There are many Democrats who are pro-life. Hispanics, for example, are, are significantly pro-life. And I'm just wondering what led him to say this. And I, I don't know. I've, obviously, I have not spoken with him. But you kind of get the feeling. You get the feeling that the head of the Democrat Party right now, Mr. Tom Perez, is under a lot of pressure from the left of the party, the extreme left of the party, often the contributors to the party, like Planned Parenthood and some of the feminist groups, that they have to be very tough on abortion. And it really, I think it's a short-sighted policy. They're shooting themselves in the foot. As I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of pro-life Democrats. I mean, if you're a pro-life Democrat, what do you do now when your party says you have to accept uh, a pro-choice position because they're going to have ideological purity? What do you do now? I guess you have to choose whether you're going to continue being a, a Democrat or whether you're going to do something else. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. It really makes you wonder who is running the party. You kind of get the feeling that this is a party that is being run by people who seem to be inventing new rules every single day. They don't seem to have a focus as to what the future of the party is. And if you're going to discount the pro-life segment of the population, you're going to discount half of the country. I mean, it's that simple. Roughly half and half of the country is... Uh, is pro-life and pro-choice. The other issue that we see here is the hypocrisy of the media. Can you remember or can you imagine, let me just put it to you this way, can you imagine 
if the head of the Republican Party had said, we are not going to tolerate any candidate who does not uh, believe in pro-life or any candidate who believes in abortion, we're not going to tolerate any candidates like that. Can you believe what the media response would have been? I'm pretty sure they would have been talking about the intolerant Republican Party, all oh, these Republicans, these right-wing Christian conservatives, Republicans who don't tolerate any dissent. Well, the truth of the matter is we in the Republican Party welcome and have pro-choice Republicans. It looks to me right now that the Democrats are saying, if you're pro-life, you better run under another party because we're not going to accept you. It's pretty frightening. Now, I understand, in all fairness, that Chairman Tom Perez took it back a little bit. I think he dialed it back a little bit uh, after he said that. But uh, the message is out there. The message is out there. That this ideological purity over abortion is clear. And I think it's a big mistake uh, by the Democrats. I really do. I mentioned that there are some other issues in the news. You have President Trump apparently this week will present a proposal on taxes. Hopefully they have got something on health care that they can do. We also hear that the funding for the wall has been pushed back a year. Uh, that, I think, uh, is going to upset a lot of his supporters, who I think were very much in tune with his uh, support for the wall. It may very well be a way of avoiding a government shutdown. That's probably what it's going to come down to. But uh, anyway, that's interesting because I thought that was one of his primary campaign uh, campaign objectives. And there's a couple of other issues that I wanted to touch on. One is North Korea. The situation in North Korea right now is totally, completely frightening. And, uh, you know, both sides seem to be escalating the rhetoric. Now, I'm not criticizing President Trump for what he's doing. I think that we need to be ready for something. But the ideal solution here would be to have North Korea basically say, not say it, but begin to back down a little bit, to have China basically push North Korea back a little bit and say, look, you got to back down. This is crazy. You know, you, you, we're, we don't need a war over the peninsula. That would be the ideal situation for North Korea to sort of go back to the old days of North Korea when they had the big parades, but they were not the threat that they are right now. I don't know if that's going to happen, but China needs to be working on that because that may very well be the only way that we can avoid a war. Otherwise, I think that we're going to back into a war. There's going to be a mistake. Somebody's going to shoot something. Somebody's going to fire a missile, and you're going to unleash. Uh, um, it's going to be a bloodbath. I'll just put it to you that way. A lot of civilians are going to be caught up in, in this uh, exchange of artillery, and it's going to be a bloodbath. I, I just don't know how else to say it. We understand that Ann Coulter, uh, you may be familiar with the controversy where she was going to speak and then she wasn't going to speak. I guess she's going back. Look, to me, the bottom line here is, whether it's Ann Coulter or whoever it is, the bottom line is that every person, every university should guarantee a public speaker, particularly a speaker that who was duly invited uh, to the university as she was. And they have to guarantee the safety of the speaker, and they have to guarantee the safety of the people who attend these events. And unfortunately, that is not happening, because in many universities, uh, you'll have a conservative speaker who comes in, and then you'll have all these masses, all these mobs who make it impossible for that speaker to give the speech and for people to listen. That's a mistake, and universities are going to have to take over. They're going to have to tell these people that if they don't like a speaker, that's fine. You don't have to like the speaker, but at the same time, you shouldn't be shutting down speakers because you don't like them. That is simply not the way it works in the United States. We believe in free speech. I don't always agree with Ann Coulter, but she's got the right to say whatever she wants. And that's just the way it is in the United States. This is uh, Silvio Canto in Dallas. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you again.